The FBI is suggesting that bombing suspect Ahmed Ra Rahami acted alone and saying that there is no indication of an active operation cell in the New York area. Joining us now with more on Rahami is Ryan Morrow, national security analyst for the Clarion Project, a nonprofit dedicated to exposing the dangers of Islamist extreme and extremism. Ryan, thanks a lot for joining us today. Thanks for having me. What evidence do we have at this point in time that would indicate whether or not Rahami acted alone? Well, the most that we can go by now is our historical patterns. We know that the vast majority of the time that we hear someone is a lone wolf, that ends up being inaccurate. It's sort of the throwaway answer when someone has a question about why something happened. The easy answer is to say a lone wolf. Um, but most of the time, even if it's just someone radicalizing that individual, there's somebody else in the picture. Uh, some of the indications that we have uh, that this is the case with this latest incident is the fact that he was going back and forth uh, to Pakistan at one point, spending nearly a year there. He married a woman there. Um, he, his uh, older brother, after attacking a police officer, fled to Afghanistan. And then the brother would travel to Pakistan at around the same time as the bomber was going there. Uh, so you're seeing all the signs right now that indicate that at the very least, uh, he knew people in Afghanistan and Pakistan that were encouraging him to do things like this, but it's probably more serious than that. Why do you think there is the tendency to throw out the lone wolf idea? I mean, why do people want to cling to that, that, that idea that someone was just acting entirely on their own? People want answers and they want quick answers. And so when there is an attack, uh, saying something is a lone wolf gives you that answer. Um, and and it, from at the time that the attack takes place, it'll appear like a lone wolf because you're saying, all right, well, it only might have required one person to carry out an attack. But the fact of the matter is, is that extremists are obsessed with their ideology. So they're going to be talking to other people. They can't contain themselves. They might be meeting someone in person to talk about it. There might be someone online. They're going to have doubts and questions about their ideology. Who do they talk to? to express those uh, questions to. Uh, so there's always someone else in the picture. One of the political reasons for this is that if you say it's a lone wolf attack, then this becomes a law enforcement issue. The inevitable crazy guy that exists in a large population that tries to harm people. Uh, but if you more accurately see this as part of an ideological movement, then you come to the more uncomfortable conclusion that this is a war. All right. Well, you uh, wrote today, quoting a friend of Rahami, who said that he had, quote, inconsistent attendance at the Muslim community of New Jersey mosque. Does this affiliation tell us anything about him? I think it absolutely does, because news reports right now are focusing on how uh, supposedly he became much more devout, um, uh, maybe much more radicalized in recent months. But now we're getting more and more information, seeing that he basically matured in his extremism, going all the way back to high school from his old high school sweetheart. Uh, he was expressing anti-American views, pro-Sharia law views. And from that foundation, that political Islamic foundation, then someone can become a violent jihadist. But that foundation has to be there first for it to happen. The reason I'm explaining all that is because the mosque that he attended is linked to a group called the Islamic Circle of North America. They oppose ISIS. They will condemn ISIS. But if you look at things they put out, like their teaching guide, they say, pursue an Islamic state, pursue a caliphate, full of anti-American, anti-Western propaganda, and then that's what puts someone on the path to adopt the beliefs of a group like ISIS or al-Qaeda. Very tricky. Well, we are seeing reports of his family actually suing the government over, quote, discrimination against Muslims. Do you think this could have been a factor in his radicalization? No, I don't. I think that this was a way of them trying to get what they wanted, a very cynical exploitation of genuine anti-Muslim sentiment. Uh, they know that strikes a chord, that that's a way to intimidate the authorities who are cracking down on them uh, because of complaints by neighbors uh, about their uh, restaurant. Um, they refused to comply with orders. And so what did they do? They shouted Islamophobia, uh, which we know that uh, opponents of our points of view do all the time. In fact, I would say even doing so, these false shouts of Islamophobia can be an indication of extremism because it's a tactic that extremists use constantly. 
You mentioned his travel to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Do you think officials should have screened him? I mean, I know they did a general screening, but should, should they have screened him more closely or in a, in a different way after those long visits? Oh, well, the obvious answer is going to be yes. With the latest information that we have being that the father reported him um, as being a suspected terrorist after he stabbed his brother, um, and then he's going back and forth uh, to Pakistan. He reportedly visited the area of Quetta, which everyone knows is like the Taliban hotspot. Why would you be going there? Um, and so he was subjected to secondary screening. Um, so there was some scrutiny of his travel, um, but apparently, apparently not enough. Um, and that's amazing to me that, as far as we know, he was not on a watch list. So he was somewhere in a database where his travel resulted in additional scrutiny, but he wasn't on a watch list. That's a failure of coordination and information sharing. Brian, the AP is now reporting that his own father reported him to the FBI as a terrorist, but later took that back. Uh, any comments on that? Well, the information we're getting about the father reporting his son as a terrorist makes sense when you look at that rather disturbing video where a reporter was asking the father questions and he wouldn't even look at the person in the camera and it was clear he was hiding something. Um, and and maybe this is what he was hiding, uh, the fact that he reported him to the authorities, but then also recanted it. So what this tells me is that based on this information, uh, he probably got scared of his son, saw him as a loose cannon. I mean, he stabbed his brother. And then at that point, the father said, I, I'm going to tell the authorities about this. And then uh, still loved his son. And so when he thought that the problem was resolved and there was a chance that he would change direction, he recanted that testimony. What do you think investigators should be focusing on at this point in time? Link analysis. What that is, is you, you take different variables, different factors, uh, such as an Islamist movement, um, not Muslims as a whole, as a whole, but an Islamist radical movement, and you do dot connecting. So, for example, if uh, we're doing link analysis and we find out that a member of the Islamic Circle of North America is preaching at a certain mosque, that's relevant. That should be considered a variable in their research, and that could lead you potentially to someone like the bomber that is attending that mosque. Given that Rahami was taken alive, how big of an opportunity is this for authorities to learn about his motives and affiliations? Big opportunity. It's surprising how often uh, these captured extremists will end up talking. Perhaps it's because they desire martyrdom, and then when they don't get it, and they don't get that guaranteed ticket to paradise in their mind, uh, that they're discouraged, and then that leads to an opportunity for authorities to learn who they were talking to, what else they know, and also just to learn from their experience in general. How is it that they went from uh, being at some point an average innocent human being to becoming this monster? Well, I know the public is definitely wanting to know a lot of those answers. Ryan Morrow with the Clarion Project, thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you.